it's the Jazz, Utes, Cougars, or Aggies. These guys have got you covered. And the heat, fellas. You're locked on to Jake Scott and Ben Anderson. One, two, three, move it. On 97.5, 1280 The Zone. Powered by kslsports.com. <laughs> Jake and Ben, 97.5 and 1280 The Zone. Uh, real quick, we were talking about the NFL and the overtime rules, and uh, I read a tweet from at Blue Blood Coog, uh, disagreeing with me on, on uh, my point. He, he weighs in again, Ben. He says, despite Jake conflating NFL overtime with cats, <laughs> the overtime rules are antiquated and they suck, especially when the other rule changes have given the offense distinct advantages over defenses. Hashtag no disrespect taken, I think. Okay, <laughs> here's what I would say. What, who is it? Blue what? Coog? Blue blood Blue Coog. Blood Coog. By the way, thanks for tweeting in. I, I do appreciate it. Even though, obviously, the scores don't reflect this because... We would have games that are like 65 to 58 if this were fully accurate. It does feel to me like we're at a point where the offenses have surpassed defenses. Now, again, there was a 13-10 game over the weekend. There was. Like, that's not an offense being better than defense No, defense at all. still gets it done. More, San Francisco way more often than it doesn't. Yeah. Way more often you get a team off the field than, than you uh, end up staying on to score. But I will say, watching these games in the fourth quarter, it looks like at any given point, any of these teams can just flip the switch with their quarterbacks, who have all grown up playing Madden, and then play quarterback in the NFL like we all did playing Madden growing up, where they just throw it everywhere, deep bombs, tight ends, sideline throws, back shoulder throws, wherever you got to put it, to move the ball to put yourself in a situation to score. Because was there any doubt at any point in the fourth quarter that Brady was going to get them back in the game, that Mahomes and Josh Allen were going to do exactly what they did, that the one thing you couldn't do if you were Ryan Tannehill was gift Joe Burrow the ball like your only job is to not lose in regulation when it's tied and you have the ball best case scenario you get in field goal range worst case scenario should be overtime and somehow you threw the ball into double coverage and you gave Joe Burrow the ball back with only all he needed is what 25 yards to, to get into field goal range and that's exactly what he did but yes it does feel like offenses are getting so elite to this point now and these quarterbacks are so good and moving the ball, especially with the two-minute drill, that if you want to talk about that as the overtime reason why both quarterbacks should be able to touch the ball, I understand the argument, but I do think you're right. The more we try and solve some things, the worse the problem actually gets. Well, we're just so obsessed with fairness. And I guess I, I, guess I understand why, and I understand uh, his point and your point about rules, and actually just had another tweet coming in talking about that too, how it's, it's not fair for the defenses anymore. But how do, how do baseball fans justify that the home team always hits last? Yeah. Well, that's not fair. They right. got last at-bats. And it's like, well... Everything can't be fair. Right. Kansas right. City won the coin toss. Why don't people complain about the coin toss at the beginning of the game? Like, well, Kansas right. City got it first in right. the second half. How's that fair? Or or the, the, the vaunted two-for-one possessions in the NBA. You know, those stuff. They're like, Correct. how do people get over that? Like, sports aren't fair. And I do think, I, I understand why the coin toss specifically is difficult. Because it the coin toss has nothing to do with sports. It's a coin toss. Like, if we're honestly talking about letting talent determine the game, the coin toss really shouldn't matter a whole lot. But if you believe that an offense and defense should be ideally equal because you have the, everyone has the same salary cap and can spend the same amount of money, then your defense can be as good as any opposing offense. Then you do find yourself in a spot where you're saying, well, the coin toss really isn't about determining fairness. You just get to choose if you have the ball or not. But the opposing team's defense should be go- as good or better than your offense. Like, like uh... I understand why. I, I just understand both arguments. Personally, I would have loved to have seen Josh Allen get another touch last night. I would have loved to have seen him get another opportunity sure. to, add, to answer. I wanted to see Buffalo win. But I'll, oh, so, so did I. I. I tweeted with 13 seconds left. Like this, I, this game's over. What an incredible yeah. throw! I just couldn't believe they did it. And of course, Patrick Mahomes is Patrick Mahomes. Ben, I grew up a tennis player, and. People were excited to be my doubles partner. You know why? Why? Not because I was particularly good, but because I'm left-handed. Okay. Now, why is that an advantage in doubles in tennis? Can you just think it's really Correct. simple. Correct. It's really simple. You don't have to serve into the sun. Right. Neither one of you has to serve into the sun if you play with a left-handed player. Now, that's not fair. Because two right-handed players, somebody's got to blind themselves every Correct. time they try to serve the ball. So... 
when you're watching doubles tennis and somebody's a lefty out there and you scream, well, that's not fair. That is not fair. He doesn't have to serve it to the sun. Null and void. Null and void. It's over. I mean, Rudy Gobert has to do a jump ball with somebody who's 6'5". Do yeah. we scream, well, that's not fair. Rudy's 7'3". Right. No, they, We're you, just obsessed with fairness, and we let it get in the way of our overall enjoyment of the product because it's never going to be fair, ever. And it does feel egregious that over the last couple of years, there have been a few examples of this. Didn't, didn't Tom Brady win a game like this, too, where he got to touch the ball, and the Chiefs didn't get it? Mm-hmm. So, And you know what's ironic? Didn't the fairness end up coming back? The, like, the argument was that the Chiefs didn't get a chance to answer Tom Brady in the AFC Championship game a couple of years yep. ago. And they advocated for the rule change. And, they adv- and then a it benefited them. So, like, ultimately, fairness over a long enough period of time really does start to even itself out. It really does. If you want fairness, the Chiefs lost a game because of it, and they won a game because of it. There's no more fairness than that, and they're going to have a chance now to win a Super Bowl as a result. If I'm a Bills fan today, I'm going, how does a team who in the first half, it might have even been the first quarter, declined a penalty because they didn't want to have Patrick Mahomes have an extra play? You remember what I'm talking about? Yes. I'm trying yes. to think of what the penalty was. Was it a deep, Was it a holding? I can't remember what it was. But they declined the penalty because they said, wow, we'd rather have the down in the rearview mirror than the 10 extra, your 10 yards going back because we don't want Mahomes to have an extra play. The same team that made that decision is also the same team that kicked it through the end zone 100%. to give Patrick Mahomes as much time possible. I mean, the yes. weird thing was everybody knew that's what you can't do. That's not the overtime rules fault. That's the coach's fault. Yeah, everybody knew you couldn't kick that ball out of the end zone. Kick that was a, so weird. Kick a line driver. I mean, a good coach. Like he's a really good he coach. He is a good coach. To not again, to just not understand some of the clock situations late continues to be the most perplexing part of of uh, football. Make sure they can't return it so Mahomes has as much time as possible. Yeah, give him a dead ball at the 25-yard line where you know he's going to throw it 20 yards. To get, is it, it's a 35-yard line too, right? Like we've even made that easier now. Like yeah, all you got to do is just run as much clock as you can. Don't kick it short. You're not doing an onside kick because then he only needs one play. But yeah, you do the squib kick. You kick down the middle of the field. Line you make drive him catch it the ball. as far as you can. And if you get it to, say, the 5-yard line or the 10-yard yeah. line, the returner's not going to down it. Yeah. Correct. He's going to run around. Right. He's going to feel like he has to do something. Yes. Even if you take one or two seconds off, it just makes it dicey. It makes it more difficult. So Then maybe they can't get up and they can't get the, the field goal. And I realize and they had timeouts, those, but you know what I mean. All of those were more egregious than the overtime rule. All so, of those, we, we got to alleviate the blame on the people who were actually So involved. tell me this. What's the perfect overtime rule then? Uh, College doesn't have a right? No. You could honestly say that, hey, Bill should have had a chance to win the game. You should have, after the, regardless, both teams get at least one touch. Okay, so let's say the Bills get a touch. Allen scores. Mahomes comes back and scores again. Correct. Then do you get another chance? But Mahomes had two chances, Correct. and Allen only Correct. had one. I, I, you're right. I think you're in the exact same starting spot. I think you're, you're getting back to that exact Put argument. Put more cats into the wall. I think you're exactly right. I think that ends up being the issue. I, I, the, if you really want to adjust it, and I don't like this about soccer, but if you if you got to do it, you got to go the soccer route and just give it a, a, a fifth period. Yeah. Call it 10 yes. minutes, call it 5 right. minutes, call it whatever. I mean, that's better than, well, give them an extra possession. Or if they score a field goal, the game's not over, the other team gets a what? No, I think, what? You're, I think you're right. I, I think if you're going to extend it out, you have to say it's the clock that you're playing against and not the number of possessions. Because, yes, if Patrick Mahomes scores and then Josh Allen scores, then you're in the exact same spot of why would only one team get the ball again. And then we're going down the college route of now you're forcing teams, like do you force them to go for two and all these stupid right. rules that just take the strategy right out of it and make it more arbitrary? Certainly don't make the game better. No. No. I think you're right. That's a, I think that's a very good point. I think that's your best argument you've made so far on this point is that at some point you have to draw the line of like the score has to determine whether you win the game or not. So it either has to be a clock or it has to be the first score. And I, I, I we, we like... Winner takes all. You know, we, we, we like the, the, the do or die aspect of the overtime, and it, it is why it's still so exciting. And look, people talking about it, it's not a bad thing. You know, people talking about having this debate the next day is not a bad thing for the NFL. It certainly didn't hurt the product. Just don't overcorrect and do something stupid with the rules. That's my point. Yeah. Like after that Saints supposed pass interference a couple of years ago, they made pass interference reviewable, right. which is the stupidest thing I have ever heard. Yeah. And they, they way overcorrected based on one play. Correct. 
Oh, replay. So let's ruin the game. Replay. Yeah. Yes. As a result of that. Yeah. Yes. They've, they've changed it dramatically. I, I don't like college football's overtime. I, I don't think it's football. No, it's certainly not. It certainly doesn't feel like it mirrors what was going on during the, the, the first 60 minutes of the game. You know, it, it feels like a dramatic departure. And actually, the only, one, the only league that does it that's so different, but it seems to make sense because it's so hard to score, is soccer. Where at some point, and even then, they get a full... Their extra period is way too long. They get a full extra period, and then you go to PKs. But at least with the PKs, you wrap up the game. But yes, you have the extra period to decide it even before then. So, yeah. I mean, but but yeah, by all means, like, oh, stop don't let, here. Josh Allen didn't get to touch it. Well, get a stop. What Buffalo did was embarrassing. They let Patrick Mahomes go from the 25-yard line to whatever, the 44-yard line, so they could kick a field goal to tie it in regulation, and then they went basically unscathed. I was going to say, did, easy did, did, did the Bills stop a play in overtime? Yeah. Well, the Jazz were going on at the same time, so I was kind of I was a little right. bit divided. But uh, I'm trying to recall, did they stop a play in overtime? I don't think so. Whose fault is that? Correct. Well, it's it's the league's fault. Yeah. Right. No, that's not a clock problem. That's not a. You're right. That that that's not a rules problem. I'm with you on that on that aspect of it. Selfishly, I would have loved to have seen Josh Allen get another chance. I wanted the Bills to win the game. I'm with you. I would have uh, enjoyed seeing that as well. But it's just hard at some point to uh, to believe at some point you're ever going to make it totally fair. Uh, let's see. Just uh, Calvi tweets in uh, backing up uh, what our friend uh, Blue Blood Coog says. Says that's the key there, Jake. Almost all recent rule changes in the NFL over the last decade give greater advantage to the offense. It's not a fifty-fifty game between your offense and your defense anymore, so it should not be on a fifty-fifty coin flip. Does that mean the offense scores every time? Yeah. Again, I think go back to my point. There's way more games that are thirteen to ten, twenty-one to fourteen, where. I mean, that's five scores in a possession where each, you know, each, how many possessions does a team get? 13? 14? You know? Like, if you're only scoring three or four of those times, you can't, you can't really say the offense has a much greater advantage than the defense. Defense still wins most of the time. Almost every time. Or at least is successful at yeah. stopping a drive, forcing yeah. a punt. Right, yeah. No, I mean, in every individual series, the defense wins more often than the offense does. Yep. By far. Now, I, he's, he's right that pass interference, roughing the quarter, roughing the passer. Like, we, we've made so many advantages for the offense to try and get the scoring up. The truth is, it's worked. It's why we're talking about how incredible these games were over the weekend. It's why the offenses were so good in the fourth quarter. But still, the defense has more than plenty of opportunities. Like, there wasn't a penalty last night that, that cha- or, or yesterday or Saturday that was the reason it felt like these games were decided. Well, they've done it in basketball, too, where they've changed the rules so much that, uh, that the offense-defensive relationship is different. Who was, uh, who was the player that broke the Jazz a couple of weeks ago that they just didn't have an answer for? Oh, there's been a couple of them, I guess. Sabonis. Sabonis. That might have been the one. Forty-two, one seventeen. But it was just like a, it was just like a systemic thing. Like there was nothing that outside of him getting injured, there yeah. was just nothing that that could have been done. I mean, Kate Cunningham, they couldn't stop in Detroit either when they blew up that twenty-two point lead. They've had a few of those. Yeah, but nobody's feeling bad for the Jazz. No, I don't know. All right. Well, that's kind of the hot topic nationally. Speaking of the Jazz, Ben, you think if the Jazz can go two and two this week, that's a victory. What are the what's the uh, or what percentage would you put it on the Jazz can actually pull that off? So I think it's less likely than likely, which is why it would be successful. Like success is exceeding expectations, in my opinion, for the most part. Par for the course because I don't think anyone's going to play tonight because uh, you know Rudy Gobert got hurt late in the game. Boyan Bogdanovich twisted his knee weird and said he has a bone bruise, but doesn't know exactly what it is. I would be a little bit surprised if he plays tonight, but he kind of tries to play through everything. We know Donovan Mitchell's not there. I don't think there's any real reason to play Mike Conley on the second night of a back-to-back when he looked exhausted yesterday. Uh, so I don't think tonight's game is going to be a very accurate depiction of you know a win or a loss because I don't think they're going to have many of their guys. But so you need to go 2-1 and one against Phoenix at home, Memphis on the road, Minnesota on the road. And you should absolutely split your two-game road trip. Like I, I know Memphis is really good. I'm not discounting how good Memphis is. You also beat him in the playoffs last year in five games, and you swept them once Donovan Mitchell was on the floor. So if you have Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert in that game, like you should still be better than Memphis. They've, gr- they've grown, but you kept your team together with the idea That's of a not big if, falling though. backwards. Those two being back. Uh, and then, yeah, correct. That, and again, this is all purely if you're healthy. Mm-hmm. If you have, let's say, eight of your top nine rotation guys and your top two players, which are Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell, I think you should be really competitive to beat Memphis on the road. You should absolutely beat Minnesota on the road. You've shown that you're better than they are. Uh, and Anthony Edwards actually got hurt last night, I think. But you, you should beat Minnesota at this point. And then, yeah, you should win one of your two games 
at Memphis on the road or at home against Phoenix if you're healthy. You should win one of those games if you truly think you're a team as is that has a chance to compete and maybe get to the conference finals. I don't think they're going to be healthy, though. That's the tough part. If they're not healthy, then you can throw all that out the window. The same way we were talking about the road trip that kind of spoiled this whole run for the Jazz, which is when everyone got COVID. Like, we were talking about that. Where'd they go? They went Toronto, Indiana, Detroit. I think there might have been one other game mixed in. They went Denver, Toronto, Indiana, Detroit. And you and I said before that, if you go 2-2, two and two, you're in really good shape. Well, they ended up, I think they... They went one and three on that trip yeah, they because beat they beat Denver. Denver and that's it. But then everyone had COVID. I mean, half the team was gone. So you mm-hmm. throw those results out the window. Yes, the same way. If you're fully healthy, two and two this week. If you're not, you need to try and salvage a win. The way, the way Rudy was talking about his calf, I wouldn't be surprised if he missed at least a week. He could miss all four games. Yeah, easily. For, for Rudy not to finish the game, I think, says a lot last night. And then he talked about, too, it wasn't like a soreness thing, like he was just dealing with it, and then it became too much. There was a, a moment when yes. he heard it. And I think there was some some lost in translation issues of him talking about, and him, you know, he speaks very good English, but he, he was saying it was like, it wasn't a tear, but it was a slow tear. That's what he said. He said it felt like a tear, but it wasn't a tear. So, like, why mm-hmm. even... Why even test it at that point? Like, if he feels like there's a calf injury that you can, that's a strain that you could make worse and make very serious, like, you're better to rest him for 10 games than not have him in the playoffs. And that's horrible for the Jazz because you could, you know, we know how bad they are when Rudy Gobert's not on the floor, but you don't even risk it, especially for a week of basketball if you think a week can fix it. Nope. Yeah. Absolutely not. It's too important. And I think, I don't know this, this is just me speculating, I think they were kind of looking for an excuse to rest Rudy with his ankle anyway. That's why we saw him downgraded the other day. And that's why he's been on the injury report this whole time. But they've been so shorthanded that they've played him. Because I'm sure he was healthy enough to play, don't get me wrong. But I think they were looking for an excuse not to play him, to give him a little time, and they just couldn't find it. And so... They're going to make sure he's right. You can't. If we've learned anything, they got to have Rudy healthy. They've got to have Rudy. They got to have Donovan and Mike Conley too. But man, they're built around Rudy big time. So yeah. I don't know if we see him this week. He might not. And you know what? He also might play tonight. <laughs> Knowing Maybe. Rudy Gobert, yeah. like, it, it's up in the air, and we'll, we'll keep an eye. They should have a, an injury report coming out in the next hour. Hopefully, they do it in the next thirty minutes, and we're able to report it on the show. But it should be coming out. I would be surprised if we see you know four of the Jazz five starters. I'd be really surprised if we see that many. In fact, it's probably more likely we only see two regular starters in this uh, game coming up tonight than it is we see four. You've accused me of uh, of being too optimistic in the past. I I will I will be surprised if they go one and three. Huh? Like surprised that they won one? Interesting. That would be a tough week. And and I actually don't think it's if they go one and three. I'm going to know why they go one and three. It's going to be because they don't have their guys. I think if they have their guys, they'll go two and two. Yeah, I don't think their guys are playing. And then I will understand that. Now, what's funny, because I've got a bunch, I mean, I can pull up just because the algorithm of Twitter, I just get a bunch of jazz fans fed into my, uh, fed into my Twitter feed. Like, I'll just read a tweet. I don't follow this person. I think there's an argument to start Eric Paschal over Royce O'Neal. It's like the, the amount of panic right now that's going on in the jazz world is, is a little bit strange. I don't think there's any argument to start Eric Paschal over Royce O'Neal. Royce O'Neal shoots 40% from the three-point line, and it's, he's not, you know, he's not prime Gary Payton defensively. He's not Scottie Pippen defensively. He's still the jazz best perimeter defender. He's not incredible at it, but he shoots lights out. You have to absolutely have to have his spacing next to Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell, along with Boyan Bogdanovich for the offense to work. You put Eric Pascal out there who shoots, shoots 30% from the three-point line, and all of a sudden all your spacing is absolutely blown up. You can't run your offense at all. In that same argument, someone says, yeah, Pascal or Rudy Gay needs to be the starting four. You're taking Royce O'Neal out of the game. He's the guy who guards the other team's best player the whole game. And, and like Rudy Gay doesn't play defense. Like Rudy Gay's not. Rudy Gay gambles on a couple of steals a game. When he hits shots like last night, he's super engaged and super valuable. And if he plays like he did last night, he's going to help you win a playoff series. Like at his best, when he's playing hard, he's great. He even said earlier this year, "Why do I need to bust my butt every night to, for us to win games?" Like I'm not at that point in my career anymore. Where I have to be the best player on the floor. And and Rudy Gay shows that. He shows games where he's clearly not giving 100% effort because he's trying to save himself for the playoffs because he's been in the NBA for 16 seasons. Well, I'd like to see Pascal play more, but let's face it, he's, you know, he's not going to be a 30-minute-a-night guy. 
at all. No. He can't play that way. Uh-uh, He's not he that good. And energy guys aren't energy guys, aren't 30 minute a night guys usually because it's tough to do that for 30 minutes a night. Another tweet in this, uh, in this, this is just in one timeline. This is in one conversation from jazz fans. At this point, I'd be okay starting Trent Forrest in Royce O'Neal's place if the defense is what we want. It's like Trent Forrest shoots like 20% from the three point oh, line. And I love Trent Forrest. Yeah. He's like also, 5'10". Yeah, right. He's like, yeah, he's he's two inches shorter than Royce O'Neal. And yeah, he hustles hard, but like he doesn't play the right way the way Royce O'Neal does. He's not Royce as O'Neal, big as Royce either, like stout. How many shots did Royce get last night? It's going to look like a negative. I guarantee you it's a positive. I bet he took, would he take three shots? Went four. over three? Took, four. Over, over three from three. Did he make a shot? Nope. Go over four overall? Yeah. I know this sounds bad. That's a good game. He only took four. He's not taking bad shots. Now, and here's the other thing that he doesn't do. And again, I love Trent Forrest. Trent Forrest might be my favorite player to watch on this Jazz team, if I'm just being totally honest about it. I just like watching young players learn and grow, and I know all the flaws he has in this game, but he's really fun to watch. Royce O'Neal didn't at any point in the game dribble into the paint, get lost, keep dribbling, and jump and try and throw the ball out to the top of the key. The way Trent Forrest does a lot and turns the ball over. And Trent might have had one of his best games of the season last night right. and still makes those kind of mistakes that kill your offense. Royce O'Neal catches, he shoots, he passes, or he drives to the rim. Like He doesn't. He does every single thing that's asked of him, and that is so valuable for what this Jazz team needs. The idea of replacing Royce O'Neal in the starting lineup with an unproven player like Eric Paschal or or Royce Oneal, or uh, excuse me Trent Forrest, especially if they're going to be playing, you know, fifteen or twenty minutes is 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 insane. Royce O'Neal gives you thirty minutes of really solid, mostly mistake free basketball, and that's that's worth its weight in gold for this team. And he gets criticized for this, but as you accurately point out, he doesn't want the ball. Yeah, he's going to do all this hard stuff without requiring shots in return. Yeah. And if he can make a high percentage of his few three-point shots that he takes, which he does, last night aside, then he's a better player for you at that position yeah. than anybody else on the roster currently. Now, Royce gets beat a lot too, but who's better? And it's not Pascal or Gay. Not for 30 minutes plus a game, certainly. Yeah. No, at, at all. I mean, thir- it, it's a skill being able to play 30 minutes. Like, it's a legit skill being able to play 30 minutes in a basketball game and, and, and not ruining it. Let's get out to the zone phone. Joining us now, he's been hanging out with us uh, all show long from Premier Wave Medical. He's our friend, Dr. Justin Johnson. What's going on, Dr. Johnson? Hey, Jake. Ben, how you guys doing? Doing great. Well, yeah, well, we are great. a nice weekend? Ben did. Well, we both had great weekends. You went skiing. Yeah, I did have a good weekend. It was my wife's birthday, too. So, oh, yeah. yeah it was nice. Right, happy birthday to your wife. Yeah. Uh, let's help our listeners, uh, Dr. Johnson, because, uh, you know, a lot of people out there have been hearing about the, the acoustic wave therapy, but uh, you guys are the only ones in the market doing it better. Yeah, so there's a, there's a several acoustic wave therapy machines out on the market, but we actually have a specific type of acoustic wave therapy. It's called low and sensitive shock wave therapy. And it's the only one that was specifically designed for ED, and it's the only one that is actually FDA approved for treating the root causes of ED, which are blood vessel loss and plaque buildup. And so what this this uh, machine does is it breaks up the plaque that builds up over time from aging, and also you lose blood vessels over time, so you cannot get an erection correctly, and so it builds those blood vessels, makes new blood vessels. And it's the only one that's been shown to do this most effectively. The reason it can do this is because the energy actually travels about six inches in depth, which doesn't seem like a a big deal, but a lot of the erection complex is actually deep inside the body. In fact, more than half of it is inside the body and can't be reached by the other machines, but it's easily reached by ours. And so we get twice the effectiveness from it as the studies have shown. And so it's a great, you know, great treatment modality. And it's a good time. People are like, well, when's the best time to come and get the ED treated? Well, anytime you're starting to suffer from ED, it's better to be preventative than let it, you know, get really bad because the the worst it gets means you just have more plaque buildup and more blood vessels to grow. So we even starting to get the first signs of ED, you should come in and get it done because this is a preventative thing as well as a restorative function. And so we have great deals going on as uh, Valentine's Day is coming up. You know, we also do women's sexual health and vaginal rejuvenation. We have a couples package. So if you come in, you'll get a thousand dollars off the couples package for Valentine's Day, and then we're going to throw in a free night stay at either the Grand America Hotel or the res- uh, the Anniversary Inn, so you can try out the results of the treatment. And on top of that, we have 
zero percent financing, which means we pay the interest for you. So now is a great time to come in and get it done. All right, get it done. Absolutely, you heard Doctor Johnson three eight five three six zero wave. That's three eight five three six zero nine two eight three, or get online premierwave dot com. That's premierwave dot com. Thanks, Doctor Johnson. Thanks, Doctor. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, talk to you later. Thanks. Top three stories at kslsports dot com coming up next ninety seven five and twelve twelve eighty the zone. Off a uh, tough two point loss to the Golden State Warriors doesn't get any easier tonight. They're in Phoenix to take on the Suns. Here's Rudy Gobert talking about both teams competing hard. They played really hard. I thought as a team we played really hard. The Warriors played really hard too. You got to give them credit. You know, really play really hard defense. They all collapsed. They're a very active team defensively. They're a really good defensive team and one shot away from winning the game. So really proud of the effort of the team tonight. And uh, you know, obviously a lot of room to grow. As long as we come out with a with that with that kind of competitiveness, it's a good step for us. Jazz Update brought to you by Five Star Painting. Refresh the inside or outside of your home with Five Star Experience with Five Star Painting. They've got the time, skills, and tools. FiveStarPainting.com. That's FiveStarPainting.com. Who's got it better than us? No! You're home for the best sports coverage in Utah. You're listening to Jake Scott and Ben Anderson on 97.5, 1280 The Zone. Powered by KSLSports.com. Jacob Man, 97.5 and 1280 The Zone. Want to remind you about our friends at Built Bar. Whether it's double chocolate, peanut butter, brownie, cherry, barcia, or salted caramel, enjoy a Built Bar. 100% real chocolate, 100% real delicious. Order yours today at Built.com and save 10% off your order by using promo code ZONE at checkout. That's Built Bar. It is time now. We do it every day at this time. The top three stories at KSLSports.com. And it is brought to you by our friends at J. Brooks Jewelers. All right, Megan, let's get things started. Number one. The Utah Jazz have back to back games against the Phoenix Suns tonight and then again on Wednesday. Going to be tough tonight, Ben. They're going to be missing a lot. We have not gotten an updated injury report quite yet, uh, but Rudy uh, injured with a strained calf last night. Bogdanovich has a uh, knee contusion. Donovan Mitchell, we know, did not make the trip to Phoenix. And it's the second night of a back-to-back where Mike Conley hasn't traditionally played. And if you're that shorthanded, I know the Jazz a couple of times recently have let Mike play those back-to-back games. But if you're going to be missing Donovan, if you end up missing Rudy Gobert, there's probably no reason to push Mike Conley out there in a game that you're probably not going to win anyways. Yeah, if it's a lot lost cause, what's the point? Can I ask you an overall question about the Suns? Yep. What uh, is your believability in their ability to win a championship? I, I think they've got everything checked that you need to have to win a championship. They've got the veteran who knows how to win, which is Chris Paul. They've got the young star in Devin Booker who knows how to win it. You've got enough defense with Miles Bridges and what they can do with DeAndre Ayton. Like, they certainly have the pieces. They have the energy guy that we talked about with Jay Crowder. Like They have everything I think you need to go out and win a title. And they did last year, you know, and they still ran into a team that had the one thing that maybe they don't have, which is a top five player in the world. And you don't have a top five player in the world. It's just really hard to beat, you know, when it get, when push comes to shove. And when you run into another team that does have all those things, it gets hard to beat them. So when they run into, let's say Golden State gets fully healthy, if Clay can end up actually helping you at the end of the season, I know he didn't play last night, if Draymond Green is back and healthy, and they, they kind of are in this spot to win, they could still make a good trade still at the deadline. They've got a lot of movable pieces. Golden State has a top five player in Steph Curry, and maybe the Phoenix can't battle with that. They could not stop Giannis Antetokounmpo last year in the playoffs. So if they end up running into a team that has, you know, Drew Holiday and has Chris Middleton and has Brooke Lopez if he ever comes back. We haven't seen him. And then you also have maybe the best player in the world in Giannis Antetokounmpo. Phoenix may not be able to overcome that. But otherwise, they've got everything. But they, you're right, as you like to go back to, they may just not have a top five player. See, I, I agree with I'm just not, I agree with everything you said. I think you're right on the money. I don't believe in Phoenix all that much, but then you look around and who am I believing in? Yeah, right. There's the, the, that, that is the funny thing, Jake, to look at the NBA standings right now and say, like, man, the Jazz are in trouble. Man, the Jazz haven't played well. The Jazz are 13 games over 500. The Eastern Conference, there's only one team that's 13 games over 500. Like, the Jazz would still be the second best team in the East, and they would be tied with the Miami Heat, who they've had two pretty close games with. As the best team in the in the Eastern Conference, like and, the, the Nets aren't even thirteen games no. over five hundred. 
And the NBA is so much better than this way than they than it was when it was Golden State and everybody else. Correct. The Bucks aren't thirteen games over five hundred. The Bulls aren't thirteen games over five hundred. The Jazz are still in a pretty good spot. It just so happens that the West is really good, and we know that the uh, the Suns have won six straight. They're nine and one in their last ten. They've only got they've still only got single digit losses. They've only lost nine games so far. So they are kind of separating themselves from the rest of the pack. But they, they they're not going to have an easy path to the championship. But they're flawed the way like the Warriors were able to. And then there's yep. good teams around them. So I think that's going to be fun. Tonight, though, probably a skeleton crew for the Jazz. All right, Megan, up next. Number two. Rudy Gobert surprises uh, Vivint Arena employees. Yeah, big, uh, kind of an exciting story. Popped up on Jazz Reddit on Saturday morning. Friday night, Rudy Gobert gifted every Jazz game night employee $50. Which, you know, I, I saw some people respond on Twitter like, oh, that's peanuts to him. It's like, that's a lot of people. Every security guard, every attendant, everyone taking tickets. And then what I was most surprised by, because I was talking to Tim Lacombe, who does the pre-half and post-game shows with you, that included the temp workers who come in at night and are cleaning the arena until well after midnight. Like, Rudy Gobert really kind of just thought of everybody, filled a bunch of envelopes that he signed with 50 bucks and had them handed out. And Tim Lacombe, by his firsthand account, said, you know, one guy was almost in tears. I mean, he, he looked at it, it was like a million dollars that he had just pulled out. That's a lot of money for a lot of people, and that's a very generous gift for really, you know, n- nothing pushed Gobert to do it. He just decided to do that type of thing. And from what I understand, it's not the first time he's done it. No, he did it at uh, the beginning of the pandemic, Yeah, too. But um, apparently he kind of secretly does it pretty often. He, does. he gives a lot of money out that people don't recognize. I love that stuff. Um I mean, the, you hear stories about Shaq randomly paying off people's uh, engagement rings and yeah. stuff like that. And, and just uh, what I liked about it is the gratitude, I guess, the gratitude it takes to do something like that. Correct. Where you're just grateful for for everybody who helps make your dream possible. And that goes 100%. right down to the, the you know, the part every the level. Yeah, every yeah. level. Everyone's a part of it. Yep. Everyone really is a part of it. Cleaning the arenas. Well after midnight, getting a little meal out of it goes a long ways for a lot of people. And, and yeah, you know, it's easy. You get to certain points in your lives and you're on Twitter or you're tweeting about it. It's like 50 bucks. Big deal. It's like, man, $50 is a tank of gas for somebody who might not know where they're getting that. It's a full fridge for two weeks. You know, for a lot of people. 50 bucks is a big deal. A lot of people. $50 is a really a lot of money. And you look, I, you know, I, I do a lot of work late night into the arena. Sometimes I'm still sitting up where we work. And like there's families that come in. It'll be the, the parents and the kids are coming in. You know, it's not little kids, but it's like the teenagers are coming in to clean the arena. Like this is money that people desperately need. And if you give all four of them $50, like Rudy Gobert did, okay, 200 bucks. Is a huge amount of money for a lot of people. And, and really, people out there saying, "Well, that's penis. complaining." Oh, about I got a lot of I got a really? lot of tweets saying, "Oh, that's just penis." I, that, that's funny because I have a. I guess it's not an anecdote, but I have something that I bring up all the time. Like there are some people out there that are just grumpy and complain no matter what. Yeah. And like I always use the example, like Kevin Graham was this guy. Yes. You could hand him a hundred dollar bill, and he would go. It's not two hundred. Why isn't it two hundred? <laughs> exactly. I, if you, yeah. You're living life high on the hog. Why aren't you giving me more money? It's like, yeah. wait, what? Well, there's people like an NBA player gives the entire staff of an arena, like, which is literally hundreds of people, fifty dollars just l- out of the blue. At least hundreds of people. And there's people going, well, fifty bucks? Right. What are you talking about? Yeah. No, what? It, fifty bucks. Uh, listen, my wife and I both work, and and you know we we do fine financially. If so, if you came in and gave me fifty dollars out of the blue, Ben, I would give you a hug and probably a kiss on the cheek. Yeah, pretty amazing. No. Fifty bucks is fifty bucks. Fifty goes fifty dollars goes a long ways for you're most right. People. A fridge full of food for two weeks that's fifty bucks. Like, like yeah, and, and you know, and, and this isn't to look down on anybody at all. I, I don't mean this. There's there's great appreciation for the people who are working late into the night, like. They're taking a temp job to come clean an arena at, at 12 a.m. Can't tell me they can't use an extra fitty spot. Like that, and for Gobert to think about them is is extremely kind. And, and you know, you, you look at great jazz players on the court and who they are off the floor historically. It's not always great people. But you look at Donovan Mitchell's giving away $12 million to a school. You know, Rudy Gobert's giving $50 to everyone in the employee. Like, uh, we've Didn't got, uh, Donovan uh, at least fund the... School lunch program Granite school for district. Granite he school bought district. lunch for everybody yeah, and, during the pandemic. Like, like that sort of stuff is impactful. Correct. Like I know we 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 again we try and go. Are you team Donovan or your team Rudy? It's like you know these are the best guys the Jazz have had that are leading the team that the teams ever had. The best like people. It's easy to root for those guys, and you should uh, recognize when they do nice things like that. Awesome story about Rudy. I can't believe people were saying, "Why is it more?" <laughs> What are you talking about? Are and you, you know correct? what? To go back to the scholarships, too, that they give out with every win, which Amazing. has been a conversation we've stopped having. Amazing. All right. Up next. Number three. Here is your NFL Conference Championship lineup for Sunday. 
All right, we got good games coming up. But but let's not forget how good the divisional weekend was. I mean, the divisional round it was amazing. If you watched a game, you you got your money's worth. And the nice thing is, they were all free because you could watch them on broadcast television. But there was not a single game that wasn't worth your time over the weekend. The worst game was the Packers 49ers, and if I'd have told you the 49ers were going to beat the Packers, everyone would have said, well, that's going to be the best game of the weekend because nobody expected it. It just so happened it wasn't the one, and it was still decided on a game-winning field goal. It just had the lowest scoring. It didn't have the great quarterback play that I think uh, that we saw in every other game. I agree. Yeah. Well, So what do you think about this upcoming week? Uh, You've got, uh, uh, is it a surefire thing that we're going to get the chefs over the, uh, the bungles? Yes. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, and I don't think the 49ers now have the quarterback talent to win it. But I would have definitely said that against the Packers. <laughs> so I've been wrong. But, man, I, I mean, that pass rush from the Rams is just so ridiculous. To have Von Miller finally clicking in, oh, and he's the second or arguably third best pass rusher on that team, is just, it's really, really shocking how good that Rams team is. And when it all comes together, they're great, and still they almost blew it. Still, they tried to give that game away. So maybe it's not a, a foregone conclusion, but it really feels like we're going to see Rams Chief coming up in the, uh, in the Super Bowl. means I'm going to have to root for that McVay guy. <laughs> you know, I hate rooting for that dude. Do you like Stafford? You know what I like about Stafford is that he was patient with the Lions. If there was ever a franchise not to be patient with, it's the Lions. And he was patient with the Lions. He was a good teammate for a long, long time. And uh, I thought the way that the the Lions and Stafford kind of parted ways was cool because you don't see that all that often where Detroit was like, you know what, we don't have to move you, but we're not in a position where we're going to win. And uh, there's, you know, an opportunity coming your way. And, of course, they were compensated, too, with the trade and, and got some assets. But, you know. Parted in on good terms, and then he goes to a chance uh, to a place in the latter part of his career where he has a chance to set up and, and win. I I like the we always say this right. I like the concept of Matthew Stafford. Yeah, he, you know he's lived up to Los Angeles too, which is really difficult. A lot of guys want to go from small market bad team to the big market and be the guy. And last night he he made the throws that he had to to win that game. He's just a really good quarterback and yeah. probably always has been. But Detroit is so inept they could just Correct. never put anything around the dude. They totally wasted a good quarterback for. Like a, not a generational quarterback, but a, like a generation period of time. They just wasted this guy's time. And he wasn't a malcontent or anything like that. I mean, the best quarterback they had since Scott Mitchell. I mean, honestly, right? Like, maybe the best in that franchise's history. Right. And they didn't do anything and they just worthwhile. Wasted it. Which is funny to tank a whole season to get a quarterback. It's like, you got him. And what did you do with and it? And he had Megatron. And you can't put anybody around those two players? Embarrassing. Man, isn't it embarrassing when you're the Lions and probably your two best players in franchise history both retired early yeah. just to get away from you? Can't get away from you. Could not get away. From, couldn't get away from you quickly enough. Megatron and Barry just said, we I got get years it. left, but I'm not going to do it here. And then bitter Detroit was like, well, you're retiring then, I guess. Yeah, and didn't, yeah, okay. didn't even go play somewhere else. They would rather just not be a part of the league anymore. It's pretty brutal. Poor Lions. Poor Lions. Yet Stafford was like, yeah, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be there. Build around me. He gave me, yeah, he was there long enough to do it. Every new head coach probably took that job thinking, well, I've got Stafford. Yeah, could build around that. And then failed miserably. That's why you get to credit teams like the Bengals that get the quarterback and then figure out a way to build around. To him. build around, yep. yep. Good, good point. I want to remind you about our friends at Jimmy's Flowers. Valentine's is just weeks away. Jimmy's Flowers can make it easy with ready-made or custom-designed arrangement for her. Order today and Jimmy's Flowers doc, uh, at jimmysflowers.com or visit the stores in Bountiful, Layton, or Ogden. Jimmy's Flowers. Uh, have you ever, ever had the pleasure at Jimmy's? I haven't. Ben? If you've got a, a Valentine's, okay. Jimmy's is your spot. Okay, Mike. Uh, Mike will take good care of you. He's got a great. It's a family-run business, and they just oh, just it. beautiful arrangements. Uh, we've been uh, going up to Jimmy's around the you know Mother's Day, yeah. Valentine's Day for years, and you should see their operation. It's great, and and they you know do what? fine, fine work. Don't wait till Valentine's Day. Go get it done. Go get it done. If you haven't bought your wife, your significant other, your mom, your grandmother flowers, go do it. It's a nice thing to do. Jimmy'sFlowers.com, or they've got three stores: Bountiful, Layton, or Ogden. Stay tuned. More Jake and Ben coming up next. Ninety-seven five and twelve eighty the zone. The sports you love. The teams you can't live without. You have such urgency! This is Jake Scott and Ben Anderson on 97.5 1280 The Zone. Powered by KSLSports.com. Ben 
Spin 97.5 and 12 in the zone. Jake Scott Van Anderson. This is a summer conversation that I'm going to throw in the middle of the greatest stretch of football and a good basketball season right now. Good. What's the best nickname in sports Ever? history? I mean, this is such a summer sports radio conversation, but we just kind of organically stumbled on talking about Frank Thomas, a.k.a. We're, the Big Hurt. Which is amazing. That's What an incredibly good name. For a, a a baseball player, it so paints exactly what he was. Like, he just crushed the ball. He was larger than life. I mean, Air Jordan must is the most profitable nickname of all time. And it's just, it is perfect. For whatever for, reason, it's just simple, but it's perfect. I don't like King James because he gave that to himself. I'm with you. It doesn't necessarily do a whole lot for me. Uh, how about the answer? Yeah, great. Great. For, uh... Well, Alan Iverson? For Allen Iverson. No, here's the question. The answer was Paul Pierce, right? Is that right? See, now I'm even mixed up on that because it's behind me. And I should know this. Let's see here. The question. I think you're right. I think Allen Iverson's the answer. It is. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Hey, how dare you? No, you're right. I undercut myself. And then Paul Pierce had a stupid one, too, that they were trying to use as like a reflection of the answer for Allen Iverson, which never really made any sense to me. So you're right. The answer is very good. AI, very good. The answer. I'm sorry, I messed that one up. So for you. who else? Who else? You know what I really like? The big fundamental for Tim Duncan. Yeah, I, I think do. is great. I think that's a because it's exactly what it's he is. It's a boring is. nickname, just like him. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of you know, kid dynamite for Mike Tyson early on. I don't know if anyone really. I mean, we just end up calling him Mike Iron Mike. Iron Mike, Mike but which is a great nickname too. But there are some there are some really good nicknames out there. Mailman was great. Mailman's an all time great nickname for Carl Malone. Yeah. I mean, it's it's, uh, it's did, pretty synonymous did Hot Rod with him. Give him that? No, he got that coming out of college. I did guess. He? Yeah, I guess someone uh, at LS or at Louisiana Tech had given him that nickname. Always delivers. Yeah, because he always delivered. Just not on Sunday, isn't that the joke? That was what Scottie Pippen said to him at the free throw line. Apparently, in that That's game where right. he missed all the Whoops. all the free throws. Mailman didn't deliver on Sunday. What Best was- nickname. Well, I mean, Magic totally ditched his The truth. His real, Sorry, Paul Pierce is the, the truth. truth. The answer. I'm mixing those up. Magic totally ditched his entire first name to go with Magic. Yeah. Dr. J. Dr. Ooh, Dr. That might be the answer. Yeah. And that they called him the doctor. It was great. Wilt the Stilt. That's fine. Got to Rains. admit, Doc Rivers ditched his first name, too, to go with his nickname. Correct. And Rick Majerus gave him that nickname. Oh, really? I don't, I don't think I remember that story. It was at a, uh, a high school basketball camp. Or it might not have been high school. It might have been like a kid's camp hmm. when Majerus was in... Wisconsin, and Doc was wearing a Dr. J jersey. Huh. And so at, at his camp, Majera started calling him Doc. Doc Rivers from Stuck there on him. out. Huh. That's a great story. It is a great story. It is a great story. A local tie to that whole thing, too. Like, if your nickname is so good that nobody uses your first name ever again, yeah. that's a pretty good nickname. And that for whatever reason, it encapsulates what you do. And you're funny because Big Fundamental is so on the nose, it actually makes sense. Like Air Jordan, you could have said there's a million different words that you could have used for Air, like Clyde the Glide Drexler. Like there, there are so many different things you could have said that would describe Michael's game. But his airness or yeah, Air Jordan really, for whatever reason, worked so perfectly. Magic Johnson, it just worked Exactly right. Which again, it's it's you could have used any million of word, any million words to describe magic, but for some reason that just worked so perfectly. Where do you put Spider on that scale? I don't love Spider. I don't either. I don't really love it as a nickname. I get it. I, I understand why it fits. It, it's actually been lucky that it's kind of tied in with a very successful movie franchise at the time. There's also a lot of like logo um, potential there. I get that. Like, there's a lot of things you can do. With and the Spida. and the superhero thing in general is a little played out. And hasn't really fit a bunch of good. Like, remember Dwight Howard was Superman. That was kind of his thing for a little while. Flash for uh, for Dwayne Wade. I just haven't really ever loved this, the the uh, superhero one. Our guy, you chast a trailer weighs in. He says may not be the best of all time, but the great one just summed it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but you know what was great about that? I, I agree with you, you chast a trailer. The best part about that is Wayne Gretzky is maybe the only athlete of all time who could actually live up to that. Yeah, correct. You, you have to be so far and ahead, better than anyone, that it's not even close. And yes, Gretzky's in that conversation. Like, is there even an argument in hockey? No, no. It's, there's, there's not. There's nobody even in the conversation with him. You know, I, I, like, I didn't even love Mamba for Kobe, because that was also self-appointed. He also gave him that nickname. Yeah. So I didn't love that for Kobe either. 
No. And when I hear that, I just think of what's her name on Kill Bill. Yeah. Beatrix, kiddo. Except for they never use the name, right? Right. Uh, all right. Let's uh, let's jump out to the zone phone. He's been hanging out with us all show, and we always look forward to it when he can. He's our friend, Dr. Justin Johnson from Premier Wave Medical. Dr. Johnson, what's going on? How you guys doing this afternoon? Hey, we are doing great. Let's uh, let's uh, close strong. Let's help out our listeners. Yeah, so you know, now is a great time to talk about ED because it's so prevalent. Most people don't realize that more than fifty percent of men over fifty suffer from ED, and in fact, thirty percent of men over thirty suffer from, from ED, which is a medical disease similar to heart disease, where you get plaque buildup and loss of blood vessels. And so, you know, there's great treatments now available, non-invasive treatments. We have a great medical device called the Elmo Duo, which is a low-intensive shockwave therapy machine that was specifically designed for ED and also FDA approved for the treatment of ED. And it works fabulous. It penetrates deep, and it does a great job helping other people recover from, you know, the disease. But there's also other treatments that that are available. You know, we do injections, we do counseling, we do medicine, uh, surgery if necessary, because it's not a one-stop, one-size-fits-all type of disease. And it's a great time to get it done now because we're actually having a uh, Valentine's special. You know, we also do uh, women's sexual health, so we have couples packages. So if you come in and you get a couples package, you'll get $1,000 off. Plus, we're going to throw in a free night stay at the Grand America or the Anniversary Inn so you can try out the results of the treatments. And we also offer 0% financing. So now it's a great time to come in and get it done. Yeah, it sounds like it. Absolutely. Uh, call now, 385-360-WAVE. That's 385-360-9283. Or you can go online, premierwave.com. That's premierwave.com. It is very easy. Uh, easy. Dr. Johnson, thanks for hanging out with us today. You're the best, buddy. Appreciate you. Yeah. Take care. You. It's nice to talk to you guys. Take care. There you go. Dr. Justin Johnson, 385-360-WAVE or premierwave.com. Uh Two things. One, the big unit for Randy Johnson. Great nickname that really doesn't describe anything other than he was six foot ten. He was very big. And was intimidating. Second, Rudy Gobert out tonight versus the Suns, according to Tim McMahon from ESPN. Not a surprise. Yeah. Not a surprise. Uh, he did say this the strain's considered mild and isn't expected to sideline the all star or the all NBA big man for an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. So that's a good sign. But yeah, no Gobert, no Donovan Mitchell tonight. I don't know why you play Mike Conley if that's the point. If you're not playing Mike Conley, don't play Boyan Bogdan, but she's got a knee sprain. All right, stay tuned. Hanson, Scotty G are coming up next. Ben, I'll see you tomorrow, buddy. Adios. Thanks, Megan. Jake and Ben, 97.5 and 1280 The Zone.